And we made a couple of observations that I think are important. First of all, we observed that there's a whole range of disabilities that might be relevant as far as accessing the web goes. Typically, many times people think only in terms of being visually impaired. But while that's certainly an important condition that, that affects people's ability to interact with the web, it's certainly not the only one. Especially when you consider multimedia content. Um, because then people that can't hear um, fall in that category. There's also people with motor control issues, all right, whether it be carpal tunnel, arthritis, some neurological disorder where they can't control their hand motions um, as, as well as someone that doesn't have that disability. Uh, then there's a whole range of cognitive disabilities such as dyslexia, ADHD, and so on. Add to that, people who maybe don't suffer from these severely but have, you know, minor uh, issues with them. So, for example, an older person isn't blind, but an older person doesn't have the best vision either. All right? Or even a younger person, certain younger people don't have the best vision either. All right? Add on to that, add on to that the fact that there are some sort of situational conditions that come into play. For example, you in the lab. There's no speakers on the computers, so any audio content, unless you brought headphones, isn't available to you. Uh, a person with a broken arm, all right, they don't have carpal tunnel or they don't have a permanent uh, condition, but their, their ability to move the mouse very well could be compromised. So when we look at this, it actually is a large group of people that are in some way or another affected. And we're going to apply the notion of universal design. And the notion of universal design is that what we do for people with disabilities will also benefit, or at the very least, be neutral towards people that don't have those disabilities. So it's not like we're developing a website for the disabled people that is going to be difficult for able-bodied people to work their way through. I had a student in one of my classes a few years ago say something to the effect of like, well, just because there's some blind people in the world doesn't mean that I don't want to put videos on my site. I still want to put videos on my site even though there's people out there that are blind. And that's true. No one's suggesting otherwise. But there's things that you can do to accommodate those people that can help as well. Um, and again, it not only helps people with those disabilities, but it helps other people that... Um, don't necessarily suffer from those disabilities, maybe the circumstances. I'll give you a great example. Um, news uh, sites that have video news stories. I hate those, all right? Why do I hate those? Because I can read really quickly, all right? So rather than sitting through a five-minute video, I can scan an article in seconds and look to see if I'm interested in it. And then if I'm interested in it, maybe I'll watch the video. Yes? But don't most of those uh, uh, websites have the article below it? Well, it, it, it depends. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. What I'm saying is it's, I, I like the ones that do, all right, that, that do that. In, in other words, the statement was, is don't many of those websites have the article and the video. That gets a thumbs up from me. That's good design. But I have seen sites that just have the video. And you know, the odd thing is, is I understand why they do that. Why do you think they do that? Why do you think a, a news organization would put a video on and not have the text of the article? It, exactly. Because they can stick an ad in front of it. And you can't ignore it. All right. So, I mean, I, I get it. <laughs> But uh, it doesn't mean I like it. And from a web design perspective, uh, I don't think it's very good. All right. So universal design boils down, in essence, to a couple of fairly simple guidelines.
One is multiple presentations. And the other is simplicity or maybe clarity is another word that says about the same thing. What do I mean by multiple presentation? By multiple presentation, um, I can mean a couple different things. I can mean um, to use the example I just gave a minute ago, to have a video along with a news article that summarizes the video, for example. That's the case of multiple presentations. So I'm taking the same content and I'm showing it to you two different ways. I'm showing it to the user two different ways. All right. So that's an example of multiple presentation. Multiple presentation <clears throat> also may allow users to customize a page. I think I showed the Perkins School for the Blind where you could choose the appropriate color combinations all right, uh, that, that would help you if you were visually impaired. So that's a case of, or like I know in Angel, you can theme your page and you can have it look a certain way. Well, you might have it look a certain way just because you like that color combination or preferences, or you might have it look a certain way because that's easier for you to read. So the ability to present the same content multiple different ways is a good thing as far as universal design. Um, and again, that's why we, uh, we stress so strongly in this class having a clean separation between the content and the presentation. Right? In other words, if you develop web pages in the manner that we did, and not like some old school techniques that used font tags and this and that and the other, you can very easily separate the presentation from the content and you can take the same content and show it multiple different ways. All right. Simplicity, clarity, well, that ought to speak for itself. All right. Um, that means things such as no gratuitous elements. In other words, anything that you put on the page should add to the page. All right. That's valuable for uh, people with ADHD, for example. That's valuable for people who may be prone to seizures as far as having silly little animations that don't really add anything to the page. All right. Strip that stuff down. All right. Make sure your pages have a consistent look. Make sure your pages have a good navigation. All these things fall into that because it will help people work their way through the site. And the consistency of the layout and the design is reassuring to people. All right? And that, therefore, someone that might have cognitive issues, you know, gets a sense that they're in the same website. And as they're moving around, it's clear to them where they've been and, and where, they, where else they can go on the site and so on. And the interesting thing is, is when you look at these two things, I think you can see the really the, the beauty of this principle is that it can benefit everyone and not just people with disabilities. I mean, how many people out there are saying, no, I prefer a cluttered site with a lot of stuff that really doesn't add to the page, you know? I prefer the navigation to be confusing. I, can, I prefer a website where the pages aren't consistent. You know, no one says that. So, in some regards, this is just plain common sense and good web design. But, as someone, I don't know who, uh, said, something to the effect of one of the most rarest commodities in the world is common sense. <laughs> right? So, therefore, you might think it's common sense, but then if you look around and see some poorly designed websites, you wonder, well, how common is that? All right. Let's run down a list of disabilities. Um, and, and talk about what we can do in terms of multiple presentation and simplicity and clarity to help people with those disabilities. Let's talk first of all about people that are visually impaired. And visually impaired, we mean really a range of things, right? We can talk about people that are blind. We can talk about people with poor eyesight, poor vision. And we can also talk about people that are colorblind. 
because all these things are examples of visual impairment. How can we use multiple presentation to help those folks? Go ahead. When it comes to uh, selecting colors, you might uh, view your... I'm not sure how you do it. Uh, you might do a screen cap, paste it into Photoshop, and look at it, look at it as a black and white. Okay. Um, excellent choice. The statement was is you could take a screenshot of your page and, and paste it into Photoshop and then um, view, it, view it as a grayscale. And that's a great thought uh, as far as that. Actually, there's tools that, that even make it easier for you uh, to do that. And I'm not sure if we showed them in this class or not, but there actually is a color blindness filter that you can rub your web page, run your web page through. Through Photoshop, they talk about it, but Fortunately, I haven't found anything yet. So, uh, here we go. We can go in and we can put a page in and we can simulate a variety of color blindness. And this is kind of what you were suggesting to do, except via Photoshop, which you can do as well. All right. Keep in mind that, that for uh, color blindness, um, it's not just that people that are colorblind see in black and white. Uh, there, there's a very different sorts of color blindness. Uh, the, the inability to distinguish red versus green, I think blue and yellow. I, there's a whole bunch of different color blindness. And you can simulate any number of these. So we can go and we can put, say, all right, let's say I have blue yellow co uh, color blindness, and I go and I visit. LC's web page. This might take a while to do. We'll let it chug in the background. Let's bring up the contrast what LC's page actually looks like. All right. So that's what LC's page actually looks like. If you look at it through the color blindness filter, notice how it doesn't look identical, but it's still workable. Right? There's nothing you can do to make a colorblind person see the colors that they can't see. Right? So it, you know, you're not going to be able to um, defeat their disability no matter what you do web-wise. But what you can do is make sure that your page still works for people with that disability. So if I look at this page, yeah, I can still read everything. All right, so, yeah, not bad. Let's see, let's check a Let's check another kind of color blindness, red green color blindness. When you say that, when you say like red green color blindness, they uh, a person has a, a trouble distinguishing red from green, or the first one's blue from yellow. 
And if you notice, like let's look at something on the page. Like notice the stripes of the flag are red. Notice that with the color blindness filter, the stripes are this sort of greenish, reddish color. All right, so that's how people would see red or green, is they'd see it in that kind of reddish, greenish blend. Let's find something that's green on our page, if there is anything. Not really. Uh, this arts and culture looks green. And if you notice that the, the green, what's green on the page, sort of resembles the red. So it's not like they, they see in black and white. Um, it's that these colors sort of uh, merge together and they, they can't really distinguish them. And the whole guess in the whole thing of there's rods and cones in your eyes and all that and smarter people than me could probably explain it better. But in essence, that's the effect of it. So, an excellent point then is you pick color combinations where there's a sharp contrast with that. And avoid color combinations which there isn't that sharp of a contrast. You know, and that will that will um, you know, uh, assist people um, with that. Go ahead. Like a red type on a green background. Probably wouldn't be good. Terrible. It would be terrible, right. Likewise, yellow on a blue would probably be terrible. All right, because there's a yellow-blue color blindness yeah, as well. Within the color spectrum, those two colors are exactly opposite one another. And to normal people, provide a great deal of color. Right. But there's a way that we can provide a good contrast, you know, by, by picking other combinations of colors, we can achieve the same good contrast for people that can see and, and not, uh, not uh, affect the people that are colorblind. So picking good color combinations is something we can do for colorblindness. And again, if you think about it, who wants to have to squint to see, you know, yellow text on an orange background, for example? You know, so you, you know, that benefits people that are, are able to see as well. All right. How might we use multiple presentation with color blindness? The principle of multiple presentations. How could that come into play? That is taking a, a piece of content and showing it a couple different ways. Okay. You could show a, you, you, you could have a black and white and color version of the picture. That might be one way. Any other way? A multiple presentations, taking the same content and showing it a couple different ways. Well, one thing is to give people the options of the color combination. We talked about that before. So, for example, you mentioned, well, yellow and Blue, that's a great contrast for a lot of people. Well, make that an option then. So if, if you know, have that an option and have other options um, that people can choose if that isn't such a great color combination for them. So that would be one way to do it. Multiple presentations also works this way. Let's say I want to put a warning on my page. You know, let's say I have a block of text that say warning. All right. Or something that I really wanted to emphasize, you know, on, on a particular web page. You know, the, the inclination is, well, if it's a warning, I'm going to put it in red, right? Because red typically in our culture means it's something special, it's a warning, it's important, you better look at this. Well, what if someone doesn't see red? What if someone has red-green colorblindness and they don't see red at all? Okay, so one possibility is you could use red on a different background and change both the color and the uh, background. That would be one possibility. What else could you do? You could make it flash on and off, but I would suggest not doing that for the, the seizure thing. Uh, and plus, the, that can be distracting for people with ADHD. But you're definitely on the right track. Well, I can make a bigger font. Or I can make it a different font. Or I can make it in italics. Or I can make it bold. Or I can 
put a border around it or whatever. So all the things that we learned to do via CSS, you could do, all right, in addition to the color. So if I have a warning on the page, I might make it red so that it stands out. But I may also put it in italics, all right, so that people that are, are not colorblind, they'll see it in red, and that will draw their attention to it. And people that are not, or people that are colorblind, will see us in italics and say, hey, there's something different about this. Remember, we use these stylistic things, these typographical things and these style things to convey meaning, to give extra meaning. So if someone sees a block of text that is in a regular font and sees a piece of text that's in italics, that stands out. Question or comment? Okay. Yes. I have a question. Uh, when you, let's say you offer several different sizes of fonts, mm -hmm. I've seen web pages that, that have right. pages in different sizes. When you click on one of those links to a different size, does the entire page have to, will the browser refresh the entire page? Yeah, the, the question is, uh, the question was made is, if you do something like this, you have the ability to change the size of the font. So you can make it small, you can make it medium, you can make it big. And the question was, is does that reload the entire page? And the answer is probably not. I guess it depends on the technique that the developers use, but it doesn't need to. All right, so we can just change. It can do a couple of different things. It could use JavaScript to change the um, to, to to change some of the style stuff, or it could do it a variety of different ways. But it doesn't need to reload the page to answer your question. What are other things? What can we do for a blind person in terms of multiple presentation? That is showing the same content a couple different ways. Well, we talked about a couple of these already. We talked about the alt attribute on an image, all right, putting uh, a text explanation of the image associated with the image. We talked about having a, uh, a text description of an image that we have. Um, and we talked about if there's a video to have text explaining what happens in the video. And again, that's valuable for people that are visually impaired or for people that simply don't want to watch the video and would rather read through that. So that's the case where multiple presentations benefits both groups. Yes? An audio file you can have an audio file. Yeah, you can have an audio file uh, for, uh, of the written text to, to do that. Or again, through the use of the assistive technology, they could, um, you, they could have the page read to them. What about people that can't hear? What can you do? What's, what's a couple ways that you could have multiple presentations for them? Pardon me? Vi oh, videos will do the visual part, but they wouldn't be able to hear the audio then. What could you do on audio? Subtitle, so you could have captions all right, on the video. Or what else? You could have a transcript of the video. All right? You could have where someone takes and, and, and writes you know, a transcript of, of the video and conveys the information that way. And again, the same things apply. All right. I may prefer to read a transcript of a video as opposed to um, watch an entire video. Or if I'm in a situation where it's noisy, you know, I'll do this at home. If it's noisy at home, I'll turn the captions on on a DVD. Just you know, that helps me if I have trouble hearing something. I can I can read it on there. So again, even if even if you are Deaf per se, you know, there's things, you know, there's situations in which those kinds of things will be helpful. Now, here's the interesting thing. You know, we talked about providing an audio file for blind people, but then we also talked about, well, transcript of an audio for deaf people, all right? Because an audio file might have to help a deaf person, but it does no good to. Oh, no, an audio file might help a blind person, but does no good for a deaf person. 
So what do you do? Do you throw in like everything? That, and the answer to that is no. All right. Again, remembering that the second component of universal design is simplicity and clarity. All right. So when you're designing these things, and again, I use the word design to mean to deliberately think through a situation and to come up with a plan of action and, and address it. You design it. In other words, you don't say, well, multiple presentations benefits people, so I'll think of all the different ways that I can do this. I'll have a video, I'll have an animation, I'll have... No, it doesn't work that way. You judiciously pick the couple of things that you think will be most effective in communicating your message to uh, the audience. All right? Now, for people that have motor control issues, what are some things we can do for those folks that either relate to multiple presentation or clarity and simplicity? Put them, put them, make, make buttons big, make them far apart. All right, that's one. Now, if you think about this, this is definitely a case where everyone has this situation when it comes to surfing the web on a mobile device, right? Because it's tough for people to press, or to click a link if it's very tightly spaced on a mobile device as well. So this is a case where as mobile uh, browsing of the web becomes more popular, um, it's an issue on mobile devices as well as a B issue for people that have motor control issues. All right, so big targets, widely spaced. Keyboard shortcuts are possible as well. Whereas instead of clicking on something, you can press an arrow key or press control or alt something, and you can do that. All right. Um, we look, there are techniques that you can do that, that work in some browsers. Okay, that's not what I really thought it was. How to create keyboard. So, for example, we can put an access key of A would make Alt A the shortcut for something. So, let's make a little dummy HTML page here. And I'll just put in a few tags. I won't put in a complete web page. So I'm skipping some important tags, but just because I don't want to spend too much time typing. So I could do this.
Repeat that, please. Yeah, HTTP colon. Oh, you don't need the www no. No. The browser. Yeah. go to Google without using the mouse. All right. Now, it doesn't work on all browsers. I believe newer browsers would implement that feature. All right. But that's variable for, for people that have trouble navigating around. I know a lot of people, if you look at, if you look at real expert users, um, a lot of people, like when they're, when they're doing Word or Notepad, you know, they got those shortcut keys memorized and they're, they're just boom, 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 boom. And it's like, I've been working on computers for you know, you know, starting back in the log cabin that I was born in, you know, and uh, I don't have those memorized, but a lot of people do, and, and it can be very efficient. So it benefits those users as well. Again, universal design benefits not just people with disabilities, but other users as well, because some people would prefer to use the keyboard to interact than that. So um, that's a case of that. Um, so I could click on it, or I could Alt-G. That's giving an al alternative in, I guess you'd call it presentation in that case. Two different ways to access that link. Um, let's see what other ones. Oh, cognitive disabilities and epilepsy and things such as that. What are some things that we can do um, for those folks in, folks in terms of simplicity or multiple presentations? Well, things such as keeping your page simple, all right? Not having a lot of extra stuff on it. Especially animations, which could, in the case of people with epilepsy, trigger seizures. So keeping the page, having a simple, consistent layout, and eliminating stuff that isn't necessary. This is where design really becomes a balancing act. Because one of our goals is to provide the same content a couple different ways, but another one of our goals is to keep things simple. So we have to find like the right mix of those things. Of having a couple different ways maybe of showing a video. So having a video and having a transcript for it. But not putting so many things in that it will overwhelm people. And not putting stuff in that uh, is going to distract people from the important stuff. Again, you know, a lot of times people when they do web design, they'll think, if five things on a page are good, or if five things on a site are good, then 50 will be really good. Well, that's not the case, right? Because if those five are truly the most important things that people are coming to your site for, by making them just one among 50 things, it makes them harder to find. And it has a potential to distract people. So you want to be very judicious in the stuff that you have and stuff that you put on the site. It doesn't mean you don't have a lot of stuff, it doesn't mean you don't have a lot of content on a page, but the stuff that you put on a page or the stuff that you put on the site should add value to the site. Should help either you, your organization, or the users achieve their goals. And just don't put stuff in there just because, oh, I think it would be neat if we did this, or it would be look good if we did that. Should really do all these things with value. All right. Simplicity in terms of the color scheme, the font scheme, don't have too many fonts, don't have too many colors, because when you do that dulls the impact of them. You know, if you have everything on the page one color, 
and you have one item on the page, one sentence on the page that's in a different color and in italics, the user's eye is going to be drawn to that. All right? And that's the way to get someone's attention. Whereas if you had every paragraph a different color, then it all sort of just blends together and nothing really gets emphasized. What can we do for people with dyslexia? Accessing. We talked about dyslexia before as people that um, confuse letters or switch letters. What are some things that we can do for those folks? I don't know if everything is uppercase, but um, having a clear font will, will do it. Um, actually, upper, a mix of upper and lowercase tends to be more readable because that gives people visual cues. I'm not an expert on dyslexia, but um, certainly the font choice can matter. Some of the more uh, decorative fonts, it's sometimes you know, going to be confusing for people to have. Correct spacing between lines can help people. Correct spacing between words and letters. And all these things are uh, attributes you can set via CSS. The other thing that can help is a judicious use of images. So if you put an image next to some words, if the person's having trouble reading the words, the image can sort of like give a little bit of a clue. So that's a case of a multiple presentation um, <coughs> helping people that um, are dyslexic to, to give them a context. The image gives them a context, and that context may help them read the words on the page. Now, there's some more specific things that when we get into our next couple of topics, that is forms and tables, will come into play. All right. Um, there's some good resources on Angel that I encourage you all to take a look at. under resources. HTML5 accessible tables, we'll talk, when we talk about tables. Accessibility resources. Here's a PowerPoint I did. This is a good section, especially on forms and tables, but this summarizes a lot of the techniques that I spoke about today or at least it used to summarize those. Notion on universal uh, accessibility. Here's an online accessibility test. Here's about forms and so on. This is actually a good article to read. Actually, which one? Not this one, but... There's one that says how people with disabilities access the web, which is a good overview on assistive technology. And I hate when people move pages around. All right. Anyhow, there's some good resources to get more information on the topic. The colorblind test. A web anywhere is a screen reader that can be used um, like, for example, if, if a person is using someone else's computer and they're visually impaired and they don't have the screen reading software installed, they could run this. All right. Um, we'll go over more accessibility things when we get to it. Um, it's the vision of the founders of the web that the web be accessible to everyone. 
right? Regardless of what kind of computer you're using, what kind of platform, or what kind of disability that people have. So I think it makes good business sense to do it, all right? In some cases, it's the law. And certainly, it seems like the right thing to do, all right? One wouldn't want to exclude people with disabilities from a college campus, certainly. And one certainly wouldn't want to, uh, by extension, um, limit access to a website um, for a college or for any other institution. Now, your project design, I believe, is due next week. All right. Are there any questions about it? I would encourage you, and I forget exactly when it's due. I don't know. Pardon me? November 7th? Yeah, that sounds about right. Which would be what? Wednesday of next week? Something like that. At any rate, I would encourage you to ask questions if you're, as you're working through this and ask questions of me. Share with your colleagues what you're working on and get some feedback on it. Um, you're welcome to do that before the actual due date. It's actually due Thursday. Okay, so you got an extra day. I messed up and thought this class, when I put that deadline, I messed up and thought this class met Tuesday and Thursday. So you get an extra day as a result of that. All right, questions? All right, we'll see you up in lab.